Hi everyone and welcome to our newest webinar in the series that we're doing this spring. My name is Jennifer Fox and I'm with the Knowledge Translation team here at the Human Early Learning Partnership at the University of British Columbia. We're lucky enough to have Dr. Kimberly Schonert Reichel join us today to talk about the Middle Years Development Instrument. Many of you are familiar with this instrument, but I'll, um, she'll give a brief overview of it and then after 45 minutes of discussion, we'll save 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, just hold them to the end and then you'll be able to type them right in on your screen and we'll um, send those off to Kim and she'll answer them right away. So the Middle Years Development Instrument, for anybody who's not familiar with it, is a survey that asks children in both grade four and grade seven to report on critical components of development that are strongly linked to their academic achievement health and well-being. So we're here with Dr. Kimberly Schonert-Reichel. She's the pr principal investigator of the MDI. She's also an applied developmental psychologist and professor in the Department of Education and Counseling Psychology and Special Education here at UBC. She's been conducting research in the area of child and adolescent social and emotional development for over 20 years. Specifically, her work has been to identify the processes and mechanisms that foster positive development in children, such as empathy, optimism, and altruism. So thanks a lot for joining us today, Dr. Shonert Reichel. Hi, thanks, Jennifer, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone out there. I'm sure that um, many of you I know, and some of you are new, and I'm um, looking forward to sharing this information with you this afternoon. So thank you um, for taking your afternoon to come and listen, and I'm hoping that I can answer your questions at the end um, and uh, see hopefully some questions emerge from this. So let me, I'm just going to begin now. <coughs> I'm going to begin with a background and a story. Um, I always like to be able to begin with a story that just sort of draws you in and helps you understand a bit of what I'll be talking about. I'm then going to be talking about why now, why now do we need an instrument such as the Middle Years Development Instrument? Why do we need to understand children's social and emotional lives inside and outside of school? What will this information bring to us and how will it lead to creating more um, positive uh, lives for the children and, and in their context. I'm going to talk about some of the recent science on resiliency. I've been doing research on res ch children's resiliency for over 20 years and really trying to identify what are those factors that make a difference in a child's life. And the importance of the middle years, of why do we need to be concerned with those years. And uh, just as a brief definition, when we talk about the middle years, we generally refer to the ages between 6 and 12 years of age. And then, of course, talking about the Middle Years Development Instrument, or MDI. And I will say this, this session is really just a brief overview of the MDI for further details if you really want to uh, learn much more in detail about how to bring the MDI to your school or community. I will give you information at the end of how, how to contact our implementation team here at the Human Early Learning Partnership. And then at the end, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and uh, <laughs> foresee some of the questions that you might have and, uh, and try and provide some answers to some frequently asked questions. It's just sort of an overview. Um, the Middle Years Development Instrument uh, began, uh, the development of it actually began in 2006 and uh, was first piloted in 2009 and we now have been doing it for a few years at least. And so I'm hoping, um, I get a lot of questions, and I, and I think I know some of them that already emerged, and I'm hoping you also ask some new questions I've never heard before that I could hopefully answer. So I'm going to begin with a story. Um, my, as, as Jennifer was saying, I have been doing research on children's social and emotional development in schools for over 20 years. And some of this work really began in around 2000 when I began to really try and understand the ways that we could do interventions in school to prevent problems in children, to head off problems before they emerge. And one of the programs in which I began to do research was called, uh, is called The Roots of Empathy. I know if I, would, if I was speaking to you all, I would all have you raise your hands and see who all has heard of the Roots of Empathy program. 
Uh, some of you, probably many of you, have heard of the program, which involves bringing an infant and his or her caregiver to a classroom over the course of a year. It's for children in K to 12. It began in Toronto in 1996 by Mary Gordon and is now in over eight countries around the world and has reached almost a half a million children. The premise of the Roots of Empathy is an infant is really the springboard for conversations about emotions, about how we're feeling. And so every month, the infant and his or her mother um, or father or other caregiver visits the classroom to have discussions about the baby that then springboard to discussions about children's own emotional lives and their understanding of others' emotions. So I'd like to begin with just an excerpt from the book, The Roots of Empathy, written by Mary Gordon, that really illustrates um, how we need to not only focus on the sort of academic or um, school uh, success lives of children, but their emotional lives as well, and how these can have far-reaching implications with what we do in school. And I also want to mention that the Roots of Empathy program is a universal prevention program, which means it's, it's about promotion, health promotion and social emotional competence, and is universal in that it's geared toward all children, not just certain children with special needs or who've been identified. So here I go, I'm gonna read you a story. Um, it's Mary Gordon talking about um, uh, Roots of Empathy programs that she watched in Toronto. So here I begin. Darren was the oldest child I ever saw in a Roots of Empathy class. He was in grade eight and had been held back twice. He was two years older than everyone else and already starting to grow a beard. I knew his story. His mother had been murdered in front of his eyes when he was four years old and he had lived in a succession of foster homes ever since. Darren looked menacing because he wanted us to know he was tough. His head was shaved, except for a ponytail at the top, and he had a tattoo on the back of his head. The instructor of the Roots of Empathy program was explaining to the class about differences in temperament that day. She invited the young mother, who was visiting the class with Evan, her six-month-old baby, to share her thoughts about her baby's temperament. Joining in the discussion, the mother told the class how Evan liked to face outwards when he was in the snuggly and didn't want to cuddle into her and how she, she would have preferred that he was still a bit more of a cuddly baby. As the class ended, the mother asked if anyone wanted to try on the snuggly, which was green and trimmed with pink brocade. To everyone's surprise, Darren offered to try it. And as the other students scrambled to get ready for lunch, he strapped it on. Then he asked if he could put Evan in. The mother was a little apprehensive but she handed him the baby and he put Evan in facing towards his chest. That wise little baby snuggled right in and Darren took him into a quiet corner and rocked back and forth with the baby in his arms for several minutes. Finally, he came back to where the mother and the Roots of Empathy instructor were waiting and he asked, if nobody has ever loved you, do you think you still could be a good father? So that story, um, I'm sure some of you might be feeling a bit misty-eyed, as I did the first time I read it. Um, it's so poignant in the fact it talks about the struggles that children have and the idea of how their emotional lives play such an important role in schools and in communities and how we not only have to attend to um, helping children develop their academic skills, but their emotions as well. And one other thing about the Roots of Empathy program, it's a un as I mentioned before, it's a universal program. So it's aimed at not just helping um, work with individual children, but working with the entire context. And I'll get back to this issue later about the idea of why the MDI is a population level tool as opposed to an individual uh, assessment tool. This quote by Aristotle, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all, really illustrates that this notion of focusing on uh, the emo social and emotional lives of children is as important as the academic. And I want to reiterate here that um, Aristotle, he was around a long time ago. However, the science, the neuroscience in particular, but the research really that supports this notion has just emerged in the past decade. 
And in fact, um, we now know how much cognition is embedded within emotions, that if you, how you feel affects how you learn. And I'll be talking a bit about this. And this is why we need to focus so much on helping children develop the social and emotional competencies and well-being and identifying the factors that support that as well as um, to really help them be successful in school and in life. So why now do we need to be concerned about this? And I'm just going to briefly go through some of the issues of which we need to be cognizant in order to um, address children's social and emotional needs. First of all, and I'll talk a bit more about this, is about we're finding in the research that there's really decreased empathy in children today as opposed to other decades. There's increased bullying and factors that are really, it's emerging as such an important topic of the amount of bullying that children have and how children are victimized sometimes on a daily and weekly basis and how that affects their both short-term and long-term well-being. Children today are undergoing uh, enormous amounts of stress. Um, you know, I wonder how many of you are stressed <laughs> now. Um, some of you might have been running from, you know, another meeting and running into here and just feeling like there's, um, there's actually an increase in a sense of time urgency. I don't know how many of you actually wish you could have more hours in the day to fit everything in. Well, children also are feeling that stress, and I think um, we also know that that stress can have really detrimental effects, particularly to brain development. Children under high levels of stress actually have increased cortisol, which is a hormone that we all have, but under extreme levels, we have very high levels of cortisol that can actually get in and actually um, somehow negatively influence something we call executive functions or prefrontal cortex where we make decisions and a ability to self-regulate. So children undergoing a lot of stress might even look like they have ADHD because their inability to concentrate and focus as well as sleep deprivation and I'll talk a bit about this. We know children in poverty, we have very high rates of children in poverty in BC and it's a, it's a growing challenge as well as mental illness among children. We know this is a growing problem, especially um, among um, children in the later school years and er adolescents. One in five children have a diagnosable mental health problem. In British Columbia, the number one mental health problem is, and you're all probably just thinking this right now, anxiety. And you are right. Um, we have growing amounts of anxiety in children. So what we need is to identify strategies and uh, programs and practices to head off these problems before, like mental illness that before they begin. We also know in the research on resilience, um, it isn't just the children in poverty who have problems. It's actually um, children that come from very high socioeconomic status backgrounds. Sonia Luther, who's been doing research in the area of resiliency for more than three decades, talks about the psychological costs of material wealth and the culture of affluence. And in fact, in her work, she's found that children from the highest socioeconomic status backgrounds actually have the highest levels of depression and anxiety in contrast to children from middle or lower income areas. They also have higher rates of substance abuse and they talk, uh, she talks in her research about the high pressure that is put on these children. So I, I just also want to talk about, you know, when we talk about resiliency and identifying children who, um, the factors that promote resiliency, I don't want to just focus on the children who come from lower e economic areas, but children from very high affluence also need the same support and context and love and caring that children from all levels of society need. And we also know from the research, as I sort of highlighted a bit before, that children today are less empathic and more self-absorbed than previous generations. There was a longitudinal study done from the 70s to 2009 that found there a real decrease in empathy, particularly among undergraduate uh, student, college and uni university students. And um, you know, when you talk about this, you wonder, well, why are they less empathic? And a lot of people identify, you know, is it because we don't have the social supports we've had previously, where children take care of younger children? Um, certainly the Roots of Empathy is a, is a place to sort of bring up empathy by helping children think about younger children. Or is it even social media now, where you have YouTube and Facebook and selfies and selfies? <laughs> you know, that whole idea are, um, and, and just the internet and the idea that when you have a screen in front of you, you're less likely to 
you know, feel for another person. In fact, I've studied empathy for a number of years, and one of the most important factors of empathy is being able to see a person's facial expressions and be able to, we are sort of wired to empathically respond and mirror those emotions when we see them in action, which is much harder on a computer screen, like I am right now, because you can't see <laughs> me. So it just, it is important to think about that. We also know, um, as I mentioned, this is what I was talking about, the college students between 1979 and 2009. That's just a citation to that research I just cited. We also know narcissism on, on the rise, I think uh, has the same kind of culprits of this idea of you know, Facebook and um, social media. You know, I don't want to vilify social media because it has some amazing opportunities um, you know, and connections to people. In, in positive ways, but we also have to think about the, the sort of dark side of this type of social media, as well as, um, for example, some one study found that 81% of 18 to 25 year olds thought getting really rich is an important goal, and only 30% thought, thought helping those in need is important. So again, we need to think about how can we, um, in fact, deal with this in our society. And, I don't want to say it's just like a nice thing to do. I want to say that it actually will lead to the survival of our planet. <laughs> you know, think about um, how we're going to get along and climate change, for instance. We know it's happening. We can't really prevent it. But those who work in climate change said, really, what we need to do is figure out how are we going to get along across countries to deal with decreased resources, to compromise, to be empathic and understand. So these skills are not just important for um, the future, uh, children's future in terms of their relationships with others and their long-term employability, also important for other larger issues in our global um, economy and globalization. Sleep loss or deprivation is another big issue we're dealing with today. And in fact, uh, Stuart Schenker, and many of you probably know Stuart, I heard him talk about a statistic that said, children today get 20% less sleep than a decade ago. You know, and this idea of um, what is happening. So first of all, um, there's two different, different dimensions of sleep. There's sleep quantity and quality. So you could have, you know, go to sleep for eight hours but have very poor quality, which also has detrimental effects. We know that um, quality, that sleep quality and quantity has a number of negative effects, as you can read on your screen about anxiety and depression, cognitive functioning. and and actually, some would argue that sleep deprivation looks like attention deficit disorder. So children who come into school not having enough sleep, being interrupted throughout the night, and, um, and here, oh, I guess this is going to be recorded, so no one tell, so I, I, I didn't mention this before. I have two boys, adolescent boys, this is, I'm sorry, I just have to bring up the sleep loss or deprivation because I'm always worried about them. One's 14, Gray, one's 17, Griffin but you're sworn to secrecy, you can't say their names any place, okay? Um, you know, Griffin, who is 17, used to sleep with his stuffies when he was just a sweet little sugar pop. And now, what does he sleep with? And you're all, I'm sure you're all thinking, his cell phone. You know, they text each other during the, I don't know. And, um, you know, do, but all of us, I think, are so hyper connected to social, to our technology, it interferes with sleep. And um, I'm just gonna put it out there because if anybody's really interested, I've been dying to do a study um, that I really wanna see if a school took an or a community decided to focus on really trying to teach about sleep, helping parents and uh, other adults and children learn about sleep, could you in fact um, decrease the amount of self-regulation problems that children are having? You know, anyways, it's just something out there and. I have other ideas and I'll let you contact me if anyone's interested in helping me realize that <laughs> dream of uh, figuring out that. Okay, so what now? What do you do? Okay, I sort of gave you the dark, the bad, the bad news. Um, we know we need to move from a sense of ill-being to well-being and promoting resiliency in children. And this idea of resiliency, let me just define resiliency. Um, you know, I've been talking about it throughout. I haven't really given you a definition. And there's lots of different definitions, but it really means um, being successful in the face of adversity or being able to uh, 
sort of beat the odds. And uh, early on in the research on resiliency, they used to call it invulnerability. It was very interesting in the 70s. Um, and it really emerged out of research that Norman Garmazy and others were doing at University of Minnesota on children of schizophrenic mothers, where they found that these some children actually, in the, this was in the 50s and 60s, um, did well, even in the, in the face of having these mothers who with schizophrenia, and they thought, oh, for sure these kids were destined for failure to be growing up in a household, and they found some of these kids had good self-esteem, were doing well in school, had good relationships, and they started thinking like, huh, what's happened? Maybe, instead of throwing out the data and saying, oh, those kids don't fit our model of that, or they were just not going to make sense of it, they started thinking like, oh, maybe we can learn something about helping kids be successful from looking at those children and looking at what are their characteristics and what are the contexts. So the invulnerability first was described, but invulnerability almost felt like you were um, a steel doll and if anything bad sort of was thrown against you, you kind of just, it just ricocheted off of you or um, that nothing kind of harmed you. And they knew that wasn't the case. And in fact, some children who looked resilient in this moment, um, for example, experienced death of a parent, that they seemed to be doing fine, but then when they, when they were five, but then when they were 12, they suddenly started thinking as they got these new cognitive skills, what their life would have been like if their parent had lived, and then experienced depression. So resiliency can be fleeting, and it also could be context uh, specific. You could be a child who has a parent with um, some sort of mental illness or alcoholism, and the child at home is you know, getting up early, doing the laundry, making breakfast, getting the other kids to school, and then comes into school and looks like a failure. So we really want to think about resiliency um, across multiple dimensions. It's not within the child, it's actually within the context. And I want you to really think about that idea because promoting resilience is really about what we can do to make a difference. It's about action. It's not just about helping, um, you know, you're either, you either have it or you don't. We are, as adults, I want to say, we as a society are responsible for creating the context that support resiliency in young children. And this notion of looking from ill-being to well-being and promoting resiliency really aligns with this strengths-based approach, an idea that we focus on identifying ways to promote flourishing and thriving rather than just reducing deficits. Um, and even things, you know, other terms that are used are positive mental health. And so mental health is not just about reducing mental illness, but it's about promoting hope, optimism, empathy, um, these positive human qualities as well. We know from the research now is that these social and emotional skills, such as optimism and caring for others, are malleable. And the ca CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, um, sorry, my slides are having a life of their own, um, <laughs> that these um, social and emotional learning skills, CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, has identified five dimensions of social and emotional learning. These include self-management or self-regulation or self-control, it has various names, self-awareness, the ability to really recognize you, um, how you feel, how others make you feel, your own strengths, your uh, areas that you might need to improvement, how you best learn. Social awareness, including empathy, being able to take others' perspectives, stand in their shoes. Relationship skills, including how to negotiate conflicts, how to get along with others, how to have good relationships, and responsible decision making, which is the last one, is making ethical decisions and, and choices and taking responsibility for your behavior. And CASEL, um, the Collaborative for Academic and Social and Emotional Learning, founded by um, Dan Goleman in the 1990s, um, and some of you might be familiar with Dan Goleman's work, um, he wrote the book Emotional Intelligence, really highlights how these five skills or competencies are not just important for success in school, but success in life as well. And how um, they've done decades of research now that really show how important these um, these skills are for that. And in fact, one of their recent studies um, was a meta-analysis, which means it's, it's a number of studies put together into one study. They actually looked at 213 research studies of over 270,000 students, kindergarten to 12th grade. And they looked at the factors, those factors, um, that those children who received some sort of social and emotional learning program, universal, so not targeted, but not just to kids with vulnerability, but all children, 
and compared them to students or children who did not have any exposure to an SEL program or practice. And they compared them across a number of different dimensions. And what they found was just very intriguing and very groundbreaking, actually, because it was the first study of its kind. They found that those children who had been in programs that promote social and emotional learning had a 22% increase in their social and emotional learning skills, a 9% increase in positive attitudes about school. They also had an, an increase in pro-social behavior, an, a decrease in conduct problems, a decrease in emotional distress, and also they had an 11 percentile gain in their academic achievement on standardized achievement test scores. That means that addressing children's social and emotional learning needs in schools not only improves their social and emotional learning and their abilities and decreases problems, but also helps them do better in school, have higher academics. And I know one of the biggest barriers to getting to dealing with the social emotional life of children in schools is people say, we don't have enough time. We have to get to the tests, you know, we have to teach all the academic skills. And this really this says, well guess what happens when you deal with these social and emotional learning skills you actually increase learning as well. And just to go back to my comment before is that when you, uh, that cognition, you know, in the brain, we know that uh, how you think and how you feel are inextricably linked. And in fact, we now know um, some recent research on positive, from po the area of positive psychology, that when you have positive emotions, when you're happy, you actually retain more information. Um, you're able to learn more. You're able to even be more creative and open. Open. So, um, and just as an aside, of any of you who um, have to ever grade papers, if you're a teacher and you have to grade papers um, that require some subjectivity, so not a multiple choice, but some sort of essay, if you're in a good mood, you can actually give higher marks. So I think. Um, yeah, you know, I think your students all want to have that information. If you're a student, <laughs> I'm sure they would. <laughs> they would all like that. I'll be giving you like the apple. Maybe that's where the apple came from. Um, but anyways, it's really important. Um, you know, I'm just briefly touching upon the research in this area of social and emotional learning. Anybody who wants to know more can go to the Castle website at www.casel.org. There's a wealth of information. This area of social and emotional learning is growing across the world. We also know, so um, as how sticky is this um, intervention? So how, how much do these interventions actually stay with, um, with children? So there is one study that shows that children who in elementary school received a social and emotional learning program and they followed them, versus kids who did not, they followed them 15 years later until they were 24 and 27 and found that those children who had a, had during a universal social and emotional learning program during their early elementary school years, I think up to grade five, that 15 years later, they not only had a higher economic attainment, they were making more money, higher educational attainment, they're more likely to have degrees, they also had fewer mental health problems, fewer substance abuse problems, and were more likely to be involved in their community as a volunteer and to vote. So there's just so many benefits to focusing early on helping children develop these um, social and emotional uh, competencies than to wait later. And I'll talk more about this. So what's happening in British Columbia right now? We know that BC has a new education um, curriculum and assessment framework. Some of you have heard about it. And BC, just to sort of shout out BC, um, they're the first place that I know in the world that has made, um, has done the kind of um, work they, that others, that no one else has done in terms of the area of social and emotional learning and social responsibility. So these new cross-curricular competencies include a thinking competency that includes critical thinking, creative thinking, reflective thinking, a personal and social competency, which is positive personal and cultural identity, personal awareness and responsibility, and social awareness and responsibility, and finally, a communication competency of language and symbols and digital literacy. And this, um, the personal and social competency, just to highlight and sort of to give you a heads up, that the middle years development instrument actually addresses all 
all of these dimensions and that you can get data for your school districts and your communities on how your children are doing on these different competencies. I just wanted to give you... Um, so what are the differences we can do to um, make a difference in the lives of children? As I mentioned before, there's a recent science on resiliency that informs, uh, that actually really informed the MDI research. We know contexts are really critical, that we need to be aware of the context in which children develop and help address and support all of the adults who work with children. I have to say how critical it is um, the Middle Years Development addresses children's lives in schools and communities and has questions that ask children about their support, not just from their teachers at school or just from their parents at home, but also neighborhoods and in their community. We also know that um, how important a strengths-based approach is. Uh, there's an area called positive youth development that really is um, about defining and understanding how children influence and are influenced by their context over time. And as I mentioned before, the recent um, neuroscience on social and emotional learning really talks about this new science of my, how the mind matters and brain plasticity. We used to think you had this brain and it just kind of developed and it stayed the same. And we now know that there's brain plasticity and there's all sorts of inputs, both in the environment um, and in the, uh, even in your genes that help develop this, um, that influence this plasticity. Um, and I think there was another webinar on epigenetic stuff, so I think that would address this as well. The individual factors we know um, that help develop resiliency include having a positive outlook on life, a positive view of self, efficacy, a uh, sense of your own power. Efficacy really is about that. Asks for help. That is a critical skill I just want to emphasize, being able to ask for help when you need it. Happiness. As I mentioned before, we know how critical that is for well-being. Just so you know, people who are happy live longer, have better relationships, recover better from health. Um, in, there's much prosperity with being happy. Um, Self-efficacy, a sense of control over one's fate, having self-control or self-regulation, and a sense of purpose in life, what you're going to be. We also know there's, um, that relationships are really the most important. Uh, Sonia Luther, in her review of resilience research, identified the uh, research over five decades, identified the single most important factor in a child's life are the relationships that he or she has. And so um, if any of you have seen any of my presentations or anybody in the future will see, you'll always know that this slide, this quote, will be in there. As, uh, it's kind of my theme song, I want to say, <laughs> that every child requires someone in his or her life who is absolutely crazy about them. And family relationships are also critical, as well as adults in the community. We know from the resiliency research that children who are able to have not just an adult at home, but someone outside of the home, a non-related adult, also are more likely to be resilient. That we know um, there's a, a lot of research showing about that significant adult to make a, lot, a difference in the life of a child and peer relationships as well. If children who feel a sense of belonging in their peer group, who have good friendships, those are critical both for their short-term and long-term adjustment. There's a study we did um, uh, a couple of years ago where we found that just having children do acts of kindness for others actually not only promoted their happiness, but it also helped create a more caring classroom environment where children were able to have higher levels of peer acceptance. And if anybody wants this article, we could maybe post it to the website so you can see. I'm not gonna go into the details now, but it was an important study. Um, we know school is very important. Um, there's a uh, video that I can't show because it's too laggy, but I will um, highlight for you. I'll have to give, I think on the, can we give some sort of link so they can get to the doorman video? Sure, we can post it. Yeah, we'll place. post it. Um, just to tell you, I, I'm not going to tell you too much, but if you haven't seen it, um, you have to go see it. It's an amazing story of a young person's uh, tenacity, sense of purpose, sense of hope help change an entire community, uh, an entire school and community, and uh, really is very inspiring and will give you lots of positive emotions. We know that it's critical to the future of our society that children become competent adults and productive citizens and society, and, and I really want to make the case it's the society and parents 
All of us have a stake in the development of competence and in understanding the processes that facilitate it or and undermine it. So I'm now going to just take a few minutes to give you a, a sort of the sort of Cole's note version of the MDI. Hopefully I can take some questions and again, if you want more information of details about the MDI, we can contact our implementation team, our MDI project team here at HELP. So what is the MDI and why is it important? Essentially, the MDI, or Middle Years Development Instrument, is a self-report survey for grade four and grade seven students. One of the things you might ask, well, why grade four and grade seven students? Why not um, older students? And we identified these ages as particularly important for being able to prevent problems before they arise. It's, it's sort of, they're both transitional periods in development in which we know there's increased risk, but also increased opportunity to make a difference. I'm going to briefly go through six things that I think you should know about the MDI. These are from questions I've had. First, the MDI was uh, rigorously developed from science. And really, we took in decades of research to say, what does the recent science and neuroscience and social and emotional learning and positive psychology tell us? So we combed the research in, in terms of social and emotional learning, looking at positive human qualities, such as empathy, pro-social behavior, the work in positive psychology, including optimism and satisfaction with life, as well as resiliency and indicators of child well-being. So we really, the MDI was rigorously developed and really wanted to take in what the sort of groundbreaking research is in the area of what we could learn from children. The MDI was also developed collaboratively with stakeholders. Right from the start, we had a group of individuals who uh, met. We had United Way of the Lower Mainland, teachers, community members who we all, and, uh, and I do have to um, also mention Clyde Hurt, my collaborators, Clyde Hertzman, Shelley Emel, Martin Goom, uh, Anna Gatterman, were really involved in the development of the MDI here at, the, at UBC, as well as Jeff Kalbick from United Way of the Lower Mainland, and Lisa Bedrini from Vancouver School Board, as well as Dan Marriott. Um, and Lena Swice, one of my graduate students. But we all really sat in a room and went through all the different items and constructs that we thought were important. I think this is just, I just ha do have to say, this is a very rare occurrence in the field where you work in university um, uh, professors work in collaboration with community in such an integrated way. The validity and the reliability of the MDI or the psychometric properties or the scientific rigor has um, really been demonstrated and published in peer refereed journals. So it's kind of gone through rigorous review process and stands up in its, in, among its peer. It aligns with the uh, notion of children's voices. So some people um, would say, well, why, why don't you just get teachers to report on children? Why are you asking for children? And we really have found, number one, that children at this age, in fourth and seventh grade, give us reliable and valid responses about their lives. And if you want to know about how they think and feel, you need to uh, ask them. And it really aligns with Article 12 of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. Finally, or next to the last, it's a knowledge to action project. So it's not just about collecting the data and keeping it up here in our ivory tower. Oh, hopefully it's not. It's about how do we take this information we learn from children and move it to action and use knowledge translation approaches that are directed at really understanding how key stakeholders understand and use the data. And it's a child monitoring tool that can describe and understand developmental trajectories. So for example, the fourth and seventh grade, in, may, in several districts, we now have data from, um, from kids in grade seven, and they had taken the MDI when they were in grade four, so we can actually map their development. And as I mentioned, it was about children's voices and um, the upholding the rights of the child. It also is about prevention science. And prevention science just defined is a focus on preventing disorder or problems rather than providing interventions after the problem has occurred. So this is really the MDI is about getting this data to inform prevention and policies to, to head off problems before they arise. And the desired result is to promote safe and healthy behaviors and environments for individuals, families, and communities, and a focus on health promotion. So the MDI is about strengths, thriving, and assets. The dimensions of the MDI include social and emotional development, connectedness, school experiences, 
physical health, nutrition and sleep, and constructive use of time. Under, I won't go through all the, the sort of sub ones, but just briefly, social and emotional development includes things like optimism, self-esteem, empathy, uh, um, and happiness. Connectedness looks at connectedness to families, to parents, to peers, to adults in the community, as well as to um, adults in school. School experiences looks at things like how much they feel um, belonging to the school, as well as victimization. Physical health, um, nutrition, and sleep looks at, um, in terms of their perceptions of their own body image, how many nights a week they get a good um, sleep, and how many times they eat breakfast or eat meals with other adults in their family. And constructive use of times, another really important aspect of development, is what children do during the after school hours between three to six, how they spend their time. And we know now from decades of research that this use of time um, how children spend their time not only has short-term implications for how well they do in school and get along with others, but has long-range implications for their social and emotional well-being long into adulthood. We have a measure, uh, an index of the MDI that, um, that looks at these three dimensions from thriving, medium to high well-being, and low well-being. We look at, uh, and of this uh, dimension, there's five that make that up, including happiness, health, optimism, self-esteem, and low sadness. We also, as I was talking about before, foreshadowing, um, resiliency is about identifying those key assets or the nutrients in the soil. So we use a metaphor here in terms of the idea of the actionable items for the MDI and how we can support children by helping them grow by um, putting in the ecological nutrients or the, the nutrients through supportive adult relationships, positive peer relationships, proper nutrition and sleep, positive school experiences, and participation in after school activities. To date, there's been a number of districts, 2009, 2010, started in Vancouver with our first pilot. We've grown um, then in Coquitlam and Revelstoke, and then to other districts um, in further uh, parts of BC, to currently um, we now have data on um, almost 27,000 children in British Columbia. And 23 school districts have participated to date. The, um, here just a br brief glimpse of some of the Vancouver results um, from grade seven, it, just to see how we report back the data. We have a, um, a grade set, every school and every district gets a report that's up for their school and community data reported out. So every school that participates uh, gets a, a report and the whole district gets a report. This is, uh, we present the well-being index as well as uh, we have these puzzle pieces of the assets. And again, as you see, the dark brown colors are really the rich soil and the lighter colors or the really light one is like the desert. And as you see here, adult relationships were um, kind of uh, medium, whereas the after school activities and peer relationships were the deep dark assets and nutrition and sleep was very low. Um, we also look at um, how many uh, number of important adults in school. And you see here how children, uh, we report back how many children say they have two or more, one versus none at all. So those are just a bit of the highlights. We have the maps as well that uh, communicate information um, and all of those could be obtained on the website that you can download different district reports to see the maps by community. We again map children by postal code if you're familiar with the EDI and not at all by the, um, the school they go to. We're developing um, in the process of developing and uh, a moving to action so that schools and communities that do this research can be able to go to the help website and go to the MDI tools for action. You'll see, be able to see some of the contents on that on the website. There's video, we're, we're working um, on getting this. And in fact, one area we're beginning to do some uh, research and work is about getting uh, how to report the data back to children themselves and get them engaged in helping be a part of the planning to help improve their um, well as, as well. And I think I'm going to um, end there just because I don't want to take up too much time. It's 347 and I th hopefully some, some people have some questions. If not, I could go into these. Um, 
Great. Thanks Are there so any much. questions? <laughs> if anybody has any questions, you can start typing them in. Just for everybody's reference, this video will be available online probably tomorrow or even um, early m Monday morning. So check back on our events page at earlylearning.ubc.ca. Just click on the events tab and go into past events and you'll be able to find the webinar there. So if any of your colleagues missed the presentation or if you'd like to view it again, you'll find it there. And can they, um, have, can they actually say their questions? Yeah, if you, if you have a microphone that you're using on your computer, you can just raise your hand and we'll be able to take your questions that way as well. Are there any questions? <laughs> Don't see any coming in. Okay. Yet. Well, I do feel like I do just um this is uh there's a couple of people I know who might be on the webinar. We'll have to see, but I'll totally call them out. Um Jennifer Scott, community school coordinator <laughs> in Vancouver. And one of the things that uh Jennifer and her team and, and Jennifer will recall that uh some of this ideas for the MDI actually came early on out of um, not so much out of the school world but out of the community world we were really interested in looking at what children did during their after school hours and um, what i found is how many people are not don't realize the important um, repercussions for how children spend their after school time the hours between three to six and the research is really showing that children who spend their time engaged in activities structured activities um, in terms of lessons and sports have much better outcomes and well-being than children who spend their time in sedentary activities. And one thing, again, very unique about the MDI is that we not only ask kids what they're doing after school, but we also ask them for their wishes for after school time. And to my knowledge, this is the first survey of its kind that ever actually asked kids what they wish to be doing during their after school time. And what a wealthy sense um, of rich uh, sense of information you can get communities to actually find out what the children are saying they need and to actually plan, make programming based on that. Okay, great. So we do have a couple questions. Oh, yay. The first one is, why are some school di districts not yet involved? Oh, that's a good question. So one of the things, again, uh, if you, I'm, I'm going to guess that you might know about the EDI, but if not, so the EDI, Early Development Instrument for Children in Kindergarten, received provincial funding to a, be able to implement the, the EDI across every school district in British Columbia. And uh, they, I believe it's a partnership between Ministry of Education, MCFD, or Ministry of Children and Family Development, and Ministry of Health. Um, the MDI, on the other hand, I call it the little train that engine that could, um, because we have no provincial funding to support that, and that um, we do get minimal funding every year. United Way of the Lower Mainland, I have to give a big shout out to United Way of the Lower Mainland, because they really are the ones who instigated and have been supporting the MDI from its very, um, I, you know, when even the idea started. And, um, but other than that, we, the Human Early Learning Partnership does not get funding. And so it therefore has to go to districts and say, um, this is, if you want to do the MDI, it, it costs a certain amount. And we have that, it's based on the size of the district. So if you want any more information about that, you can contact Maddie and I'll give Maddie's uh, email and phone number at the end. She has all of that information of how you can get on board. I also want to mention, sorry, I just have to mention one last thing, is that this is a, this measure, the MDI, is about children within context, schools and communities. And I think um, I would like to see that schools and communities work together to, d to come up with the funding for the MDI, not school districts alone. Sorry, I just had to make that plug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The next question is, I've seen the use of this term, at risk. What are your thoughts on using this term? Is there a better way to describe these children than saying oh. at risk? That's a really great question, uh, given that I teach a graduate course on risk and resiliency in children and adolescents. And I have, uh, I actually have a paper in which I, I wrote, oh, in 2000, in which I actually spend pages and pages talking about the terminology at risk. And so, first of all, 
The at-risk, okay, so in the one hand, on the good side, it sort of identifies kids who we need to attend to, who we need, who, you know, some children who might be having some problems. I worked with at an alternative high school, actually, for kids who are identified at-risk because at-risk for school failure. They stopped going to school. They were involved in drugs and alcohol use. They were having another, a number of problems, and so it was a term used to identify them to say, we need to give extra special, um, some attention to them to help them so they can sort of get back on their footing. However, the term has really been used so much and so often for so many different things that in some ways it's lost its um, importance and that a term that's used so many times it kind of loses its real definition. And so a lot of people are saying, well, maybe we should not be using the term at risk um, instead of, uh, you know, um, something more positive because, again, it's that more negative factor. So, um, I, so I would ask you, like, do you have a better term? <laughs> Maybe someone out there has a better term we should think about together. Okay, great. I don't see any more questions. Last chance for questions, everybody. We will be sending out an evaluation, just an online evaluation that we traditionally do with all of our webinars, just so we can get your feedback anonymously about how, what you thought of the session and what sessions you'd like to see in the future. So you can look forward to that in your inbox this afternoon. I'll send that out. Looks like there aren't any more questions. That's great. Um, I mean, I probably have a hundred more things oh, to tell you about. One more. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. Says, can you say more about bullet number four? I think she means the one on your screen there. Oh, okay. The, how does the MDI align with the BC Ministry of Education new assessment framework? I'm guessing, I'm just gonna answer this bullet four. Um, so uh, one of the things about, uh, so a couple of things. So one is the um, MDI, as I mentioned before, really aligns with this focus on social and emotional learning and sort of addressing the sort of latest science on resilience and positive psychology of, self, you know, of these skills like self-awareness and social awareness and um, social responsibility. And in fact, when the MDI was being developed, we made sure that these were all included in the assessment so schools would have this information. Well, it turns out that also the BC Ministry of Education new assessment framework has a focus on social and emotional learning. It's called personal and social competency, as I mentioned, and, and every dimension that it mentions is assessed on the MDI. So if schools are interested in knowing how their children, how their students are doing on these factors that are now being identified by the BC Ministry of Education, they will find data uh, based on their um, uh, MDI results. So there's a perfect alignment. And we've been talking, I would love to ha hear more of ideas, you know, even thinking about can we present it back to schools with information from the MDI just exactly aligned. Um, one of the ways in which we report the data might be aligned exactly with those dimensions on the Ministry of Education framework. Okay, Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Next one. Is asset development in the same theoretical framework as the MDI? Yes, so you mean, um, so the Search Institute that has actually, um, the developmental assets approach of the Search Institute draws from the same kind of theoretical framework of resiliency and being able to identify those protective or promotive factors that help children and youth thrive. And so, yes, we use the term assets. We don't use developmental assets as the Search Institute does because they've actually trademarked that term. Um, but it is the same notion of identifying those factors. And what we, in identifying the five dimensions, the five assets from the MDI, which include adult relationships, peer relationships, um, school supportiveness, nutrition, proper nutrition and sleep, and uh, constructive use of after school time, those five dimensions are ones that are highlighted throughout the literature of being the ones in which are important to um, promote resiliency and well-being and thriving, but also ones that are actionable, that we can do something about. We've really had that focus in the same way of the developmental assets approach of the Search Institute. Okay. Are you collaborating with PrevNet, Canadian Women's Foundation, et cetera, and their work on teen health relationships? If so, how? Yeah, so um, PrevNet, I'm a member of PrevNet, actually, is, is my colleague and um, collaborator on this project, Shelley Emel. And so we work with, um, actually, we just had a uh, MDI strat strategic advisory meeting today and talked about how we can even solidify more of those um, relationships between PrevNet, 
um, because certainly we have, in fact, on the MDI because of our connection to PrevNet, um, and they have, for the most part, been focusing on bullying and relationship problems for the past several years. We have um, items that assess victimization on the MDI, so we look at victimization in terms of um, social, verbal, physical, and cyber bullying. Um, on that. With the other groups, we have not collaborated, um, but I would love to hear more if you have some ideas. Um, we also have connected to the McCreary Center Society for Youth Health um, and their work as well. But thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Take care.